Hello, it's Lewis here. Welcome to my physics kitchen. In this video here, I'm going to go through some practicals that you can carry out at home. And these ones are based on the GCSE physics required practicals. Now, the first one is to do with specific heat capacity. This is to do with the energy required to heat up one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Now, there's an equation that says E equals mc delta theta. And so to work out the value of C, the specific heat capacity, we need to look at the energy transferred, the mass and the change in temperature. So first of all, we're going to be heating up some water. So water is our substance. This is a liquid rather than solid. Um, to work out the energy transfer, we're going to be using a kettle. Now, if, you're, if you actually look at the bottom of the kettle, there's often a label, and this tells us the power rating. This one here is two and a half thousand watts. So when the kettle is turned on, every second, two and a half thousand joules of energy is transferred to the kettle. And if we were to use uh, our phone as a stopwatch, we could then record the power, which in this case is two and a half thousand watts, and then we can just time that by the time in seconds to go to see energy transferred. The other thing we can do is we can use a measuring jug, again, the kind of thing that you might have in your kitchen somewhere. In this jug here, I've measured out 500 millilitres of water. Now you've got to remember that one millilitre is equal to one gram. So if we know the volume from the measuring jug, we can then work out the mass in grams or indeed kilograms. So for this one here, I've got 500 millilitres of water. So that is the mass of half a kilogram. Now the other thing we need to do is look at the change in temperature. Now that water, uh, we can actually measure it using, if you might, you might have one of these at home, this is just a baby thermometer. This one actually works by measuring the amount of infrared radiation given off. Now normally you put it in your ear, uh, you press the button, and then it tells you the temperature. But we can also actually use this to measure the temperature of that water. So if I just point it at the water inside, this is giving me a temperature at the moment of 14.6 degrees. So the starting temperature is 14.6 degrees in this case, but if you can't measure it at home, if you don't have a thermometer, then maybe use a value of about maybe 15 degrees as a rough estimation for the temperature of the water coming out of the tap. So what we can do, we put our water in there, we know the mass of it, we know the starting temperature, and if we turn the kettle on and start our stopwatch at the same time, this is now going to heat up the water. And it's going to heat it up until the kettle turns off when it gets to exactly 100 degrees. And when it gets to 100 degrees, the kettle turns off, and that means we know we've got our final temperature. And again, if we've got the time here, we can then use the equation that says the power times time divided by the mass times the change in temperature is equal to specific heat capacity. And you should be getting a value in the region of about 4,180 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. So that's the kind of thing that you could try at home. But seeing as we've got a measuring cylinder, and again, if we're in the kitchen at this time, we can also use some weighing scales to record the mass of something. So first of all, if I put the measuring uh, jug, so not the measuring jug on top of the scales, I can reset this to zero. Okay. So now we can record mass because it's given our mass in grams, and we can record volume, which means we can then look at the density of objects. We could, for example, look at the density of water. So if I pour this water in, we could then take measurements of the mass and the volume. And again, you, this isn't as accurate as what you might do in school, but it's going to give you a good estimation. And that means we could maybe look at the volume, the mass, and therefore the density of a liquid, or we could try and put a solid object inside it as well. So maybe we wanted to look at the average density of an orange. We could put the orange into the jug, and here you've got to be careful with some objects which might have an irregular shape, but they might float. So maybe what you need to do is very carefully push this down with a fork or a knife, and that means we can actually then look at the total volume that is, uh, the water is displaced by. And if we know the start volume and the end volume, we can then work out the volume, in this case of the orange. We can look at the change in mass to get the mass. So we can look at the density of objects as well. Now, if you do have a thermometer and you've got some boiled water from maybe when you've looked at specific heat capacity, 
There are a couple of different experiments that we can do to look at the rate of heat transfer. One of them could just be to take a container, we pour some freshly boiled water into it, and provided you've got a thermometer, what you could do is you could look at the temperature of the water at this time. You could then maybe look at how the temperature of the water changes with respect to time. Maybe if there's no insulation around the outside of this mug, maybe you could then try putting different materials around the outside. So you could maybe try a sock, for example, or some uh, packaging that you might have from some parcels. There might be some silver foil from the kitchen or even cling film. There's going to be loads of things around the house that you could use to pad the outside of this to look at how different insulators affect that rate of cooling. And again, this is provided you've got some kind of thermometer. So again, we can just take the readings maybe every minute. And actually this one's beeping because the temperature is greater than 38 degrees Celsius, which means that if it was a person, it would have a temperature. So one thing we can do is we can use the same container and just have different thicknesses of insulation or different materials to see how that affects the rate of cooling. But you might also have another mug, which is a different colour. And you could then do another practical where we're looking at how different surfaces affect the amount of infrared radiation either absorbed or emitted. So over here, we might look at using our thermometer. If it's an infrared thermometer, we can point that at different coloured surfaces. And provided we've got the same temperature inside to begin with, we can see how different surface colours affect the amount of infrared, infrared radiation emitted. So that one there might be a bit more of an advanced physics practical, but effectively we're just looking at similar containers of different colours. Now over here, again I found this in the kitchen, this is just um, a tray that can go in the oven, and I've just put some water into the bottom of it. Now this is a really nice practical, and what we can do here is we can actually measure the speed of a wave in a liquid. And we can measure the speed by looking at the frequency and the wavelength. Now for this one here, um, I've just got my normal ruler from my pencil case, uh, and we've put that on the bottom of the tray underneath the water. You might need to maybe sellotape it down before you put the water in. I then have my dibber, which is what I'm going to be using to make waves. This one I just built out of some spare Lego blocks, but again, there'll be something in your house that you could use. And what we're going to be doing here is we're going to have a certain known frequency of waves and we're then going to measure the wavelengths. And for this one here, you might need a bit of help. But what I did was I went to YouTube and I just found that you can find videos that have metronomes at different beats per minute. Now this one over here is 120 beats per minute. And when I play it, This just gives us a regular beat that we can follow with our dibber. And because there's this regular frequency, I can make sure that I'm pushing and making the waves at a constant frequency. Now we've got to convert from beats per minute into beats per second, because we always measure our frequency in hertz. And we do that just by dividing by 60. 120 beats per minute would be equal to a frequency of 2 hertz because there'd be 2 beats a second. If you found, and again there's loads of stuff you can find on YouTube, you could try it at 60 beats per minute, so 1 hertz. You could do it at 90 beats per minute, 1.5 hertz. And every time we do that, we're making waves that go across the surface of the water. Now if you had somebody else helping you, while you're making these ripples, you could take a picture and then you could then analyse the picture to very accurately measure the wavelength. Because what we have, as you look down onto this tray here, is we've got the length of the wave just above where that ruler is. So that means we can very accurately not only uh, know the frequency of the waves, but we can very accurately measure the wavelength of the waves. And then there's the equation that says V equals F lambda. You multiply the frequency in hertz by the wavelength in metres to get our wave velocity in meters per second. So that's a really nice simple one. Now the other thing I have in here um, is some sugar, some small sandwich bags and an apple. And there's some other experiments that we can do where we need to know the mass of something. Now normally if you have a small apple it's got a mass of about a hundred grams. So an apple has a weight of one newton, a mass of 0 0.1 kilograms. 
But sometimes we want to be dropping weights or masses, and therefore what we can do is we can make our own 100 gram masses. And this is going to be useful for a practical where we can look at the link between force, mass, and acceleration. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to put my bag onto my uh, mass balance, and then I'm going to just record when we get to 100 grams. I can then tie my bag up, and now I have my 100 gram mass that I can use for some other experiments. But we don't just want one of them, we want several of these so we can have different 100 gram masses that we can actually attach to a car. So let's go into the living room. So in this experiment, we have our bags which have 100 grams of sugar in, so we've got our 100 gram masses. We've also got um, a car, this one I just made out of Lego. Again, you might have something similar that you might have in your house. It's attached to a bit of string that's got uh, a bag tied on the end. And if you have this at the end of a table, when you let this go, it causes the car to accelerate. Now what you can do is you can measure the distance that, that car accelerates through, which is going to be probably equal to the height of the table. So we've got our distance s. The other thing that we can do is use our mobile phones to record the time it takes to get from the start to the end. And then we can then use this formula over here that uh, links the time, the distance travelled, and therefore the average acceleration of that car. So what we can do here are two different experiments. One of them is we're going to be keeping um, the total mass that accelerates the same. And what we're going to be doing is altering the force that's causing that. Now the total mass is the mass of the car and the mass that's actually hanging over the edge of the table to pull it down. And so say for example here, uh, we'd obviously take the, we'd record the mass of this using our scales from in the kitchen. We might load up the car with our bags. And what we have here then is the whole thing that's accelerating is all of this mass added to that mass together. So in this experiment, we're gonna be keeping the mass the same, but we're gonna alter the force which is causing the acceleration. And we can do that by altering the mass of the bags which we have tied onto the end of the string. So for this one over here, as we keep doing the experiment, we can repeat it. We can make sure we maybe get three results each time. We can look at the time that we can then use to work out the acceleration. But for this, we're just changing the, where the mass is um, because we're going to be changing the size of the force acting down. And the force is equal to the mass of the bags overhanging the side of the table multiplied by the gravitational field strength, which is 9.8. Now, the other way of doing this experiment is we keep the force the same, but we change the mass. So maybe we have the same number of bags which are overhanging the edge of the table. And here what we're doing is maybe the first time we just have one bag on the car, the second time two, the second, third time three, and so on. So what we're doing now is we're changing the total mass that's being accelerated while keeping the force the same. Not forgetting, of course, that the total mass of the thing that's accelerating is equal to the mass of the bag overhanging the table, as well as the mass of the bags here and the mass of the car. So for that one there, we're looking at how there's this relationship between the acceleration and the mass. Effectively, the bigger the mass, the lower the acceleration. So this one here is a nice straightforward way of doing it. Again, there are going to be some limitations. We're not using a pulley, so there's going to be some friction between the string and the edge of the table. There might also be friction in the wheels, and maybe you could try and overcome that, perhaps by lubricating the wheel bearings with the olive oil from the kitchen, for example. But again, this is trying to do some kind of physics with what you have at home. Now, the other thing that we can do is if we do have these bags, we've got our masses ready, and that means we can then maybe investigate the extension of objects. Now you might not have any springs at home, but you might have maybe a piece of plastic from a shopping bag, and you could extend and see as you add more masses to that uh, thin strip of plastic, how the extension varies with the weight or the force being applied to that. You could also try it with different sweets. So maybe you've got some strawberry laces. Why not uh, sellotape really securely a strawberry lace to maybe the top of a shelf, and then just load it up with different bags and look at how that behavior uh, changes when you have more force added to it.
I hope there's some ideas there that might help you doing some practical work of your own at home. I'm filming this during the whole COVID-19 lockdown, so I really hope that if you're watching this, you are safe at the moment, and some of the ideas I've used will help you prepare for your exams in the future, whenever they might be. Don't forget, of course, to subscribe on YouTube at Physics Online, and also have a look at GCSEphysicsonline.com, where I've got hundreds and hundreds more videos and extra resources to really help you understand GCSE Physics. Thank you.